Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to this broadcast of God's Word being preached today. And it's our prayer here at First Christian Church of Greensburg, Indiana, that God will just take His Word and use it in both of our lives to mold us more and more into the image of Christ. Now, life has a way of teaching you some lessons along the way, doesn't it? And I remember growing up, my mom was always listening to the local Greensburg station, AM 1330 WTRE, and she was constantly active in different games and contests that they would play on the radio. And I remember this one time, they were doing a challenge where you had to tell how much a certain grocery item cost at Aldi's. And they would have two different people call in, and whoever was the closest would win whatever the prize was they were giving away. Well, one time I called in and my mom knew the price right on and I won a pair of monster truck tickets for me and my dad. That was pretty cool. So another time, maybe a year later, my mom just tells me to call in. I have no idea why I was assuming, which would become a big mistake, that I was trying to win another prize. But it must have just been where the public was giving their opinion on something. So a sane person would do this. They would have called in, gave their answer, and then hung up. <laughs> but not me, okay? I was ready to win some more monster truck tickets. So I call in, they answer live between all, uh, before all 26 people listening, and I say whatever it was my mom told me to say. The host thanked me and was ready to move on to the next caller, but that's when I blurted out, well, did I win? <laughs> and I think I kind of threw the host off for a second, and I just kept saying it. Did I win? Did I win a prize? Was I right? And not having a clue that there wasn't a winner. There wasn't a right or a wrong answer. And my mom's over here just dying, embarrassed, saying, just hang up, just hang up. And I think the radio host made a joke about me and eventually hung up on me after about 30 seconds of me acting like a fool. But you know what? Lesson learned. Listen to your mama and just hang up the phone, okay? But my dad's favorite life lesson to joke around with us as kids was, hey, don't eat yellow snow. Or how about this one? No matter how hard you try, you can't baptize cats. <laughs> I like this one too. And you, you women and girls would understand this better than I. When your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. <laughs> or what about this one? Never ask your three-year-old brother to hold a tomato for you. Important life lessons. And then there's some serious ones here. So spiritual greatness is achieved through serving others and being humble. That's good. Or what about this one? Losing your soul to gain the world isn't worth it. Well, today I wanna to welcome you back here to the fifth week of our series called Disciple. And if you wanna go ahead and start to turn about three quarters of the way through your Bible to the book of Mark, that would be great. Mark is the second book of the New Testament, Matthew, and then you come to Mark. So go to Mark with me, and we're going to be in chapter 6 today. And let me just remind you of kind of the, the main theme of this book. The reason that John Mark wrote this was to show primarily a Roman audience that Jesus Christ was the servant-hearted Son of God. And one of the main threads that we see running throughout this book is Mark teaching us what a disciple of Jesus really looks like. Why is that so important? I think because there are so many misconceptions out there of what it really means to be a Christian. And usually it's because we don't know what the Word of God teaches. So what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Some people think because they were raised in church, daddy was an elder, grandpappy played the piano, his dad helped build the education wing, that somehow that automatically makes us a disciple. And while you should be proud, please don't mishear me, you should be proud of that heritage. If your last name goes back six generations in a church, praise God, that's awesome. But that doesn't automatically make you a Jesus follower. You just had a great example and a foundation laid before you, and that's something to be thankful for. Now, some think that, that maybe giving money to the church or, or going on a mission trip or holding an office, that that makes you a disciple. Others get baptized because grandma nags them to death about doing it and they want their get out of hell free card and, and then you only see them at Christmas or Easter. And while my words may have just came across a little bit strong there, the book of Mark makes it clear that a disciple of Jesus denies self, dies to self, 
picks up their cross daily and actually follows Jesus. Not our version of Jesus, but the biblical version. So we're not looking at how we can try harder to follow Jesus. We're talking about what it looks like to surrender everything, to surrender more and more over to his lordship every day. That is our goal. Less of me, more of Jesus. Less of me, more of him. And today we come here to Mark chapter 6, and he's just spent, uh, sent his disciples out, Jesus sent his disciples out two by two to preach a message of repentance. And basically he tells them, hey, all I want you to take is a staff and the clothes you got on your body. No money, no bag, no belt, no nothing else. And to a planner like me, I'm thinking, Jesus, that's pretty irresponsible, but we know what he's doing. He's showing them how God provides every time we follow him by faith. So we fast forward past this passage where John the Baptist was killed for preaching truth. And we know that Jesus took that pretty hard. That was an emotional time of mourning for him. Okay. And then if you'll flip with me here to Mark 6, let's go ahead and start here in verse 30. Mark 6 and let's read these first three verses of this passage. Verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Talking about that little journey that he sent him out to preach, okay? Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Now, I heard uh, someone make this statement years ago, and every day I realize it's more and more true. They said, sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is to go home and take a nap. <laughs> can I get an amen on that one, right? So go ahead. Uh, if you want to grab your outline for me, don't forget that how you do that is you can go to the Version Bible app. Down at the bottom right-hand corner is those three lines. Hit that for the bigger menu. Go to events. Go to First Christian Church of Greensburg, Indiana, and then you can see our outline. But here's what I want you to see. The first fish and bread lesson of the day. A disciple knows when to rest. A disciple knows when to rest. Now, don't misunderstand this, okay? This is not an endorsement for laziness. There is too much of that in our world today, and God's word makes it clear. Laziness is not a mark of a true disciple of Jesus. And just to be real with you, Growing up in a very blue-collar family, the son of a mechanic, the son of a cleaning lady, I wouldn't change that upbringing for anything. My parents started with nothing, and they worked hard to provide for our family, and that work ethic was instilled in us kids as well. But as an adult, I've wrestled with being a workaholic. And I'm not standing here claiming to have this perfect balance between hard work and rest completely healthy at all times because the Lord knows how hard this is for me as well. In fact, guys, when I wrote this message, uh, it was on a day that it was supposed to be my day of rest. So that's my confession booth. And my wife would be over here nodding her head yes and saying he needs to be home. But, but there's no question as you read through the ministry of Jesus, he was always making time to get away from the crowds to a secluded area to recharge with the Father, to rest from his ministry, and he did that so that he could truly go forward and make an impact for the kingdom of God. And so in this passage from verses 30 to 32, we see that the disciples had just gotten back from a tour where they were preaching, where they were healing the sick, where they were casting out demons. This would have been a, let's just say, a stretch you way beyond your comfort zone type of trip, okay? They had completely had to trust God to provide, to protect, to lead them. And here they are probably on a spiritual high because they've made a big impact, and yet Jesus can also see that they're tired. They need rest. See, all of us are called to use our gifts that God has given us to serve him, okay? Some of us are called by God to do that full-time or part-time vocationally, and others, most people, are called to do that as a volunteer, as uh, maybe apart from your day job. And yet ministry can be absolutely exhausting, even when God is moving and doing really great things like he's been doing here at FCC, you still need rest in Christ 
Or listen, it don't matter if you're Billy Graham, you're going to head towards burnout and you're going to be good for nothing if you don't get that rest. And sometimes that means disappointing some folks. Sometimes that means saying no to some things that, that sound like good things. But I love this quote by Steve and Mary Farrar in their book called Overcoming Overload. They compare our lives to a song when they say it is the rest that make the difference in the music of our lives. They really are the pauses that refresh. And I'd never really thought about my life as a song before this. And I know you music people could describe this better than I. You could use some music terminology, which I probably can't do, but it makes sense. It's kind of the, the, this is my way of explaining it, the the ebbs and flows and the, the powerful moments and the lighter moments and even the rest or the pause that all work together to make a song beautiful and impactful. And it's when we get the rest that we need in Christ that we can truly get recharged and we can truly serve Jesus the way he calls us to. So I guess you can say that your preacher gave you permission today to go home and take a nap. (laughs) Now, let's talk about the second fish and bread lesson. A disciple leads with compassion. A disciple leads with compassion. Now, once you get that filled in, go ahead and turn with me here to Mark chapter 6, verses 33 and 34. Mark 6, 33 and 34. As we see this attempt to kind of get away and rest is actually interrupted. And that happens a lot. And, And I don't know about you, but sometimes when my plans or my rest is interrupted... I don't always respond as nice as I probably should, but I love Jesus and I love how he responds in grace and compassion. So look at Mark 6 with me, 33 and 34. It says, But many who saw them leaving, so they got in a boat, they're leaving, they recognized them and they ran on foot from all the towns and they got there ahead of them. So I think it was somebody, I saw a commentator that said that it would have been probably about a four-mile boat ride and about an eight-mile walk or run. So the people see what direction they're headed. They can figure out kind of where they're going to land roughly. And so they actually take off there ahead of time, and they get there before the boat even arrives, okay? So they're on foot kind of running around. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. A college professor had met his new class on the first day of school. He stood before the students. He gave a nice introduction to the class, even talked about his credentials. And when he was done, he looked around the room and he asked the students, if any of you think you're stupid, go ahead and stand up. Well, you can imagine, I mean, nobody's going to stand up to a question like that. They were kind of shocked by it. Like, what's this guy doing? So he asked it again and he just kind of waited. I mean, it was awkward, just staring everybody in the eyes, waiting for somebody to stand up. And finally, a kid in the back, a boy in the back stands up and the professor says, okay, so, so you think you're stupid. And that's when this brand new freshman says, well, not really. I just didn't want you to be the only one standing. (laughs) See, Compassion is stepping out of my own shoes to walk in someone else's for a moment, whether I agree with their actions or not. And here Jesus looks out on this crowd of mostly people who are lost. And one unique thing about the feeding of the 5,000 is that it's only one of two specific miracles that's recorded in all four Gospels with the resurrection of Jesus being the other one. I, I find that fascinating. And I know John tells a lot of different stories in the other three. That's probably why. But this word compassion in the Greek is more than just, you know, I'm empathetic and I care about others. I mean, Jesus looked out among this crowd and he saw people who were following just to be healed. He saw thrill seekers who just came to see the show. John also records that there were people driven by political ambitions who wanted him to be their political deliverer. That's why they were following And yet, knowing the motivation of most of their hearts wasn't good, knowing that that most will soon reject him when he calls them away from their own agenda to a kingdom agenda, he still shows compassion. Now, this word compassion literally in the Greek means to be moved in one's bowels. And I know that sounds really strange, but it's more than, I feel sorry for you. 
It's this emotional response to your plight that I care so deeply that I'm disturbed within and I act with compassion. Kim Moore and Pam Melskog in their book wrote it this way. They said true compassion must flow from a river of gratitude that swells its banks with thankfulness over sins forgiven, hope restored, and wounds healed. That's good stuff. That means that when I truly belong to Jesus and the Holy Spirit is living inside of me as a child of God, that I'm going to see this world differently. I'm going to see people differently. I'm going to see their actions differently. I'm going to see beyond that thing that was just done to me or said to me that wasn't very nice. And I'm going to see a heart that maybe is hurting, that maybe is lost, that maybe is going through something really bad right now. But here's the thing. Compassion isn't always giving people exactly what they want and making yourself a doormat to be used and abused. That's not compassion. In fact, it's not much later in the gospel that, that Jesus, that the crowds follow him because he says, hey, you just want to be fed again. And he calls it out and he refuses. And even in the verses that we just read, instead of giving in to their agendas, Jesus teaches them the truth of God's word. Because compassion meets people in their needs, not in their wants, not in their selfishness. Compassion meets people in their needs. And I'll tell you, it is so easy when you're a leader to kind of become calloused to people asking for things. Any of us who have ever dealt with helping people have been burnt, lied to, and manipulated. As you can imagine, I mean, when you work at a church, man, you get hit up all the time. And it's amazing when you help one person, all of a sudden you got 10, 15, 20 people calling in the next few days because they have a pretty good network going on here. And some people are talented at crying and lying. They got some pretty convincing stories. And that's where discernment and following the Holy Spirit's leading has to be leading our life. And that's what I love about Jesus. He looked past even wrong motives, and he truly helped people where they needed it the most. And the Big C Church, not just FCC Greensburg, but the church throughout the world has to do the same thing. See, a disciple leads with compassion. Now, here's where I want us to kind of camp for the rest of our time as we look at the actual miracle here. So third fish and bread lesson, a disciple follows the God of the impossible. The God of the impossible. I love saying it like that because we have a God who can do anything. So pick back up with me here. Mark chapter 6, verse 35. And I, I just want you to kind of hang with me for a second because we're going to read several verses here. Um, but this is the story of the fish and bread, okay? Verse 35. By this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and the villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than a half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the grass. They sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, looking up to heaven, he gave thanks, broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate, and listen to this, were satisfied, that means full, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. And then it says the number of men, that's how they would have counted in those days. They would have just counted men, okay? The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. Okay, so Jesus has been teaching them, giving them spiritual food all day. But now the disciples come to him. They 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 make their request. There, there, there's a lot of people here. If you add women and children here to the 5,000 men, we're probably talking, you know, 15, 20,000 people. Easy. Could be more. They need to eat. It's somewhere probably between 3 and 6 in the afternoon into the evening. And, and they're in the boonies, man. I mean, they need time to walk to the villages, to the countryside, to buy some food, get some rest. And then he looks at his disciples and he says something crazy. He says, you give them something to eat. <laughs> I 
You give them something to eat. See, on the low side, let's just say there were 15,000 people. I mean, that's extremely conservative in my opinion. Um, there were at least 15,000 people there. That means for every man, there was a wife and a child. Okay, that's probably, you know, like I said, too low. But if each person of 15,000 people eats a third of a loaf of bread, which would have been about right for their loaves of bread. Okay, that's 5,000 loaves. So that's more than a semi truck. Okay, more than a semi truck, um, you know, uh, a semi truck load. Okay, that in fact, it's 1.2 trailers to be exact. And then you add in the crazy number of fish that may uh, take up around the same amount of space. And that's how much food it would have taken that day to feed all those people until they were satisfied and full. And yet, Jesus takes five loaves, two fish, prays, thanks God, and makes a little boy sack lunch multiply to feed everyone. Now, I wish this passage told exactly how he did it, what the process looked like, but all we know is is that he miraculously provided that food. Think about these disciples. They've been on a journey with Jesus. When he called them, man, they were raw, just like we are. They, they knew something was special about this guy, but they weren't quite ready to see him as he really was, the Son of God, their Messiah, their Lord. That took some time to work that way. And as we talk through the pages of the book of Mark up into our passage today, Jesus starts off with this call on their lives when he calls them to be his disciple. And he calls us too, because he loves us that much. Then he showed them how awesome he is by healing and driving out demons, by eating with the lowest of society and have compassion on them, by confounding the, the hypocritical religious leaders with his wisdom that the sharpest minds could not stand against, by calming the waves and making nature bow in obedience to him, by raising a little girl from the dead, by providing everything that his disciples needed on their evangelistic tour. And now he reinforces all of this again to say, I am God. That's what Jesus is saying. Because no one else can multiply a little boy's lunch into enough food to satisfy a crowd big enough to fill Mackey Arena or Assembly Hall on game day. No one can do that except for my Jesus. And I'll tell you what. There's a lot that is competing for your affection in this world, and it can be tempting. If only you rise to this level, and you make this much money, and you have this many people call you boss, then you'll be a success. And yet you could interview thousands of people who fit this bill, and when these actually surveys have been done, the results are, are staggering. Everyone thinks that they're the picture of success, and they're over here saying, man, we're empty. We're not satisfied. It's never enough. If, if only I can just meet the one, right? And I can get married or maybe just have kids too. Then, then, then that loneliness and that emptiness will go away and I'll be happy all the ding dong day. <laughs> and while I'm so thankful for my wife and my children and God has blessed me with, with them, it's unfair to expect my wife or my children to fill that God-sized hole in, that, in my heart that the famous mathematician Blaise Pascal once said, only Jesus can fill that. If only I can get this nice of a house or drive that truck or that SUV, that sports car. If only I can live on that golf course. If only I can look like her or be ripped like him. If only I can fit in with the cool crowd. If I could be popular. And yet none of those things satisfy. But when we do more than just religion, more than just going to church, more than just a token, okay, I believe, more than just good deeds and throwing some money at a cause or a church, when we truly make Jesus the Lord of our life, everything changes. Why? Because he is the God of the impossible. The God who spoke creation, who spoke in creation, sprang into existence, whose righteousness and whose love preserved Noah and his family and gave us another chance who displayed compassion on the Israelites in their constant wanderings, who turned water into wine, who healed the leper, the outcast, made them clean again, who called a flawed man to actually walk on water, 
who meets us in our junk and offers us forgiveness and hope and joy in his presence. See, we could probably go around, everybody watching this video today who's a Christian, we could go around and, and we could tell story after story of God's grace and his healing and his power and his strength and his miracles that have met us right where we are and that have changed our lives. That's the God that we worship today. That's the God who breathed his word to set us free. I, I love the story that took place many years ago. The famous evangelist J. Wilbur Chapman sat down with an elderly William Booth, the man who started and ran the Salvation Army for many, many years, bringing Christ to the poor in London and seeing God's provisions and miracles unlike many had ever seen before. And as Booth's life was coming to an end, he was an old, old man, Chapman asked him what the secret to his success was all these years. General Booth hesitated for a second. Tears streamed down his face. And he said, I'll tell you the secret. God has had all there was of me. There have been men with greater brains than I, men with greater opportunities. But from the day I got the poor of London on my heart and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do with the poor, I made up my mind that God would have all of William Booth that there was. And if there is anything of power in the Salvation Army today, it is because God has all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. Dr. Chapman said he walked away from that meeting just blown away, blown away, knowing this truth. And this is what I hope that you and I can walk away with today. Because here's what J. Wilbur Chapman said. He said, the greatness of a man's power is the measure of surrender to Jesus. Let me say it again. The greatness of our power is the measure of how much we surrender to Jesus Christ. So I hope today, as we sit in the crowd and we watch five loaves and two fish turn into two or three semi-loads, I hope we can learn these fish and bread lessons. A disciple knows when to rest. A disciple leads with compassion and a disciple follows the God of the impossible, the God who can transform our lives and use us in ways like we can never imagine. So let's do this. Let's trust this God, and let's walk in the power of the Holy Spirit today. Pray with me. Whew. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for just how good you are. You are so good to us. And in your word has a way, I love what the Bible says, that, that your word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Your word has a way of coming alive in our hearts and just maturing us and growing us deeper into our walk with you. So Jesus, I just pray, we give you permission that you will take this word, you will stir our hearts, and that you will have your way in our lives. Not our will be done, but your will be done, Jesus. So thank you for these words of life today that you've spoken over us. Thank you for these fish and bread lessons today. And Jesus, we just give you praise and we worship you. And we pray all these things in your precious and your holy name. The name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ. God's people said, amen and amen. Hey, let me give you this invitation today, okay? Uh, I realize that many people, if I would not be standing here today preaching before you today, if it weren't for a lot of people who God has put in my life, who have influenced me and helped me, loved me and my immaturities, and who have helped me along the way, answered my questions. So if you have some questions about your faith in Jesus today, we would love to be there for you. If you want to talk about what it looks like to surrender your heart to Christ, to follow him, maybe you're just battling a question or two, reach out. We would love to come alongside you. My name is Ray Sweet. I'm the lead pastor here at First Christian Church of Greensburg, Indiana. And you can email me at ray at fccgreensburg.com or you can call the church, First Christian Church, 812-663-8488. Hey, God bless you, and we pray that you have a great week.